This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. I don't know if they said it in that tone of voice, I rather suspect that they did, but thus spoke the false prophets of Jeremiah's day. If you closed your Bible, it's there on page 768, chapter 7 and verse 4. Their argument was this, here is God's great temple, one of the wonders of the world, the place where he promised his name would dwell amongst us, the place where we had, as we heard already this service, access to truth and to God's presence and to forgiveness. And therefore, as long as we have this temple, we are safe. If you were here last week, you'll have heard the essential message of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1. Jeremiah had prophesied in the, uh, the reign of three different kings of Judah, just towards the end of that nation. He prophesied judgment, disaster, an invading army from the north, uh, an image of a boiling pot bubbling over facing away from the north. And it was the, uh, a picture of the impending attack of the Babylonians, uh, of the exile of God's people, Judah, of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But Jeremiah, who was a miserable prophet and had these messages of doom, uh, wasn't the only voice in the spiritual household of Judah. Many other prophets were prepared to give much happier sermons. And they went like this. Oh, the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. So long as we have this temple, so long as we have this spiritual power in our midst, we are invincible, they thought. And Jeremiah disagrees. Verse 4, do not trust in these deceptive words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Verse 8, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Now, um, what is it that's so wrong about the message of these false prophets? At first, I thought instinctively that it was a matter of superstition. And I want us to look closely together because sometimes the message of the Bible isn't quite what it first appears. When you read it uh, on first reading, you get one idea and it turns out not to be quite right. Uh, And we can get to the right answer, not because of some magical insight that I have or um, some complicated Hebrew argument. We just have to look closely at the text and see what it really says. But initially, I thought it said, maybe you thought it said, that the problem was a kind of superstition. I've called the sermon you'll see on the outline, just on the inside of your song sheets. I've called it Rabbit's Foot Religion, because back when we planned the series, that's what I thought this was about. The temple is a kind of lucky charm for the people. We're safe as long as we've got the magic of this building. And certainly you do get that kind of superstition attached to religious places and religious things. Uh, You got it in Jeremiah's day, you get it all the way through history. So, for example, you may know that the word hocus-pocus, which sounds to us like magic, actually derives from the words of the Roman Catholic Mass, in Latin, hocus corpus meum, this is my body. Uh, Those were the words when, according to medieval Catholic theology, the bread and wine suddenly, magically became the body and blood of Jesus, And from that point onwards, this bread and wine had almost magical properties. Uh, You could take it away and reserve it and touch things with it and and almost use it like a spell. And so this Latin phrase, hoc est corpus meum, hocus pocus, became a byword for magic. I certainly remember in the church where I grew up, where there was a very high attitude towards the communion service, and everyone was uh, very reverent and wearing robes and doing certain um, rituals. And once some of the wine was spilled, and it caused an enormous panic because people thought this wine had become magical, and now the magical wine was seeping into the carpet. 
and nobody knew what you were supposed to do, and somebody conjectured that maybe you needed holy water to try and wash it out, uh, and so on. Or there's the old riddle of the medieval church. If the um, bread and wine has been transubstantiated into Jesus' body, and one of the crumbs falls to the, the ground and a mouse gobbles it up, what do you do then? The mouse has become a holy, magical mouse, and so on. There is uh, superstition everywhere in the church today. Uh, use of the church as a kind of lucky charm, uh, almost an incantation, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Well, you wouldn't maybe use those words in incantation, but many millions of people in the world use uh, a prayer to Mary as an incantation, say it lots and lots of times. Or even the Lord's Prayer, wonderful prayer that we've said together this morning, but to use it for its magical properties, our oh, Father, for la 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 under your breath, as if it will somehow ward off evil from you. Maybe people come to church seeking a, a special spiritual safe haven. So sometimes we have people in during the week who see that the church is open or knock on the door of the office and they want to be in the building because it's a religious building. And maybe some of the magic of it will rub off uh, on us. Certainly, um, the priests have this quasi-magical, incantational view of the temple, and Jeremiah warns against it. But actually, closer look tells us that the problem isn't actually superstition, but rather hypocrisy. The problem isn't that they've got too high a view of the temple. It's just that they've got too low a view of the obedience of heart, mind, soul and strength to God. Just look at verse 3. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I'll let you dwell in this place. Deceptive words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Verse 5 if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I'll let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave you of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal and go after other gods you've not known and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered only to go on doing all these abominations. The problem isn't that you've got too high a view of the temple. The problem is you have too low a view of the need for obedience to God and his laws. Here's, I think, the point of the sermon. Don't trust in religion to save you if at the same time you flagrantly disobey his law. Sometimes, uh, nowadays, we, uh, we talk about the temple, I think, in too low a way. So maybe we're influenced by the superstitions of nowadays, the way we, people treat cathedrals or, uh, or sites of pilgrimage like Walsingham, and we transfer that onto the temple and we say, look, how silly of them to get so fussed about what was only a building. That's actually not a very um, Old Testament way of thinking. The, the prophets are, speak very, very highly of the temple of the Lord. Um, it was a very wonderful place. It was a unique place. Certainly no modern cathedral is the same theologically as this place. But it was a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, at the consecration ceremony of this place, God's cloud of glory came to fill the temple. It wasn't just that they had incredible architecture, though they did. It wasn't just that there was amazing amounts of gold, though there was. But God was really present there. It was the place called by his name. Do you see that repeatedly? Verse 10, the house which is called by my name. Verse 11, this house which is called by my name. Verse 12, a reference to Shiloh, where I made my name dwell. 
See, the temple really was a wonderful place. It, it actually was the place where you could encounter God, where he was in some ways especially present. Again, that's not true of cathedrals nowadays or churches or pilgrimage sites nowadays, but it was true of the temple. That was the place where God's glory came to dwell and where you could encounter him. They were right to think highly of the temple. But their words are deceptive because the temple can't save you if you flagrantly disobey God's law. And I think that the point is, is the sharper for me because the temple really is a powerful spiritual place back then in history. But it's useless without obedience. Even true religion, even temple religion is useless without godliness. Verse 6, they oppressed the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, and shed innocent blood. There was social injustices. So um, I think, for example, of uh, the way that some of the church behaved in Nazi Germany. And people were um, anti-Semitic, and the church said, fair enough, if you want to be like that, we'll carry on providing religious services, uh, and you can decide your own social policy. One guy called Dietrich Bonhoeffer stood up against it, uh, a famous uh, Christian man, and was eventually executed by the Nazis. But he was a, an unusual voice in the church of his day. Most people happy to go along with it, and still to provide the religious services people sought. Uh, it's part of the shame of the church in South Africa under apartheid, that the churches were prepared to go along with it. Um, uh, uh, there were some voices that played against it, but not very many. We think of our own culture, uh, and our own culture makes its own decisions about um, sexuality and marriage. Church is happy to go along with it, but still to do the religious stuff on a Sunday. And Jeremiah says, no, that it's useless. It's useless to perform your religion, even if it's true religion, if there isn't obedience to God's words. Social injustices, verse 6. Um, idolatry, verse 6. You Go after other gods to your harm. Then in verse 9, we go through the Ten Commandments. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely? And then the beginning of the table of the law, make offerings to Baal. Go after other gods you have not known. And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered only to go on doing all these abominations. So this is the religion of church on Sunday and adultery during the week. Church on Sunday, but dodgy business dealings on Monday. Uh, church on Sunday, but exploitation uh, during the week. And God says, it won't save you you're not going to be okay because of your religion, even though it's true religion, if you carry on like that. And the trouble is that many of the um, other prophets and priests in Jeremiah's day, it seems, were willing to carry on performing religious services irrespective of people's lifestyles and flagrant abuses. Uh, Jeremiah was, it seems, a, if not a lone voice, certainly a minority voice, and his sermon wasn't very much uh, welcomed. Well, we hear more about what is probably the same sermon in chapter 26. We get a bit more context. If you flick over a few pages, And a little bit less detail, but you'll see many of the same ideas. I think it's probably the same sermon. Verse chapter 26, verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house, 
Speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship in the house of the Lord. All the words I command you to speak to them. Do not hold back a word. It may be they'll listen. Everyone turn from his evil way. That I may relent of the disaster I intend to do to them because of their evil deeds. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law I've set before you, to listen to the words of the servants, the prophets whom I sent to you urgently, though you have not listened, I will make this house like Shiloh, I'll make the city a curse for all the nations of the earth. Similar sermon, maybe the same sermon. And sadly, the response is not encouraging. Verse 7, the priests and the prophets... And all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people lay hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, this house shall be desolate without inhabitant? The people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Um, Verse 11, This man deserves a sense of death because he has prophesied against this city. Who was it he persecuted Jeremiah? The people, yeah, they didn't like the message, it was too negative, but also the priests and the prophets. You see, they had a different message. They said, it doesn't really matter what you do with your life, that's your own call. Uh, You must decide the path that's right for you in keeping with our society. As long as you still turn up to church on Sunday, God's doors will always be open and you'll be safe. In other words, the role of the church is just to, to baptise whatever lifestyle you've decided to follow. Uh, we don't do the same here, I'm pleased to say. Imagine in the baptism service, um, if when we'd ask those pertinent questions of the parents and godparents, do you turn to Christ? And they were to answer, instead of saying, yes, I turn to Christ, they say, what business is that of, of yours? Uh, Do you repent of your sin? How dare you, they said. Uh, What we do in our private life is is none of your business. We've come to bring our son to baptism. Now get on with the job. Uh, That is your spiritual duty. And and we trust that as long as Barnabas has the magic, then everything will be okay, irrespective of how he lives his life. That that is the view of, of some people in our culture towards the church. And it is even the view, chillingly, of some in the church about the church. Big scandal on that exact issue. People come for baptism. Is a minister allowed to ask those presenting for baptism about the lifestyle of the parents and godparents? And uh, some suggesting that that's none of anyone's business. It doesn't matter. Just perform the religious stuff and give people the security in it. Jeremiah says no. Now, it's no use, this religion, if at the same time you disregard my commandments. Uh, Church attendance is no use if you make up your own rules in your culture. Apartheid in South Africa, anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, um, gay marriage and syncretism, relativism in our own culture, and all the same... The church business goes on and on and on. Jeremiah says, no. No, in fact, God says, I'm prepared to destroy this house, even though it's called by my name. You see, they wanted to call God's bluff. They thought, yeah, God could discipline us, maybe. Uh, There there certainly are, at this time that Jeremiah's prophesying, the time of Jehoiakim, Uh, There are various military defeats being suffered. There's raiding parties turning up and carrying off plunder. So things aren't going that well politically and spiritually. But they think, oh, but God wouldn't be prepared to touch this. Uh, The temple has got to be the safe place. And they're wrong. Verse 11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? I've seen it, declares the Lord. Go to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to that because of the evil of my people Israel. Now, because you've done all these things, declares the Lord, when I spoke to you persistently, you didn't listen. When I called you, you didn't answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust, 
and to the place I gave to you and your fathers, as I did to Shiloh, and I'll cast you out of my sight. It's a simple lesson of history. Shiloh was the previous resting place of God's ark, the ark of the covenant where God's presence was with his people symbolically. And you remember the story, if you know, the beginning of 1 Samuel, uh, in the time of Eli and his wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests. Uh, they thought similarly in that sort of magic uh, rabbit's foot, lucky charm way about the, the ark. Uh, and in fact, the ark was captured and Shiloh was destroyed. God says, don't think I wouldn't be prepared to turn my back, even on the place that I've chosen to dwell. Don't think that my promises to you, here is the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. Don't think I wouldn't be prepared to turn my back on those promises if you persistently refuse to repent. Just look at the president. Where's Shiloh now? Oh, it's destroyed. Of course, we can say the same, can't we? We've got even more examples of calling God's bluff than they had. So Jeremiah says, look at Shiloh. Where's Shiloh now? The answer is just a pile of rubble, destroyed in 1050 B.C., the archaeologists can tell us that. But we could similarly say, where is the temple now? Oh, well, the temple was destroyed twice. Most recently in AD 70 by the Roman armies. Uh, it was a pile of rubble. Now there is a, just a, a mountain on which there is a mosque. Uh, no temple left in Jerusalem. Uh, God made similar warnings, didn't he, through the Lord Jesus about his churches. I'm, I think of the, the warnings to the churches in Revelation. If you don't repent, I'll take away your church. People say, oh no, God wouldn't do that. Surely the church is safe. But where is the church in Ephesus now? Largely non-existent. It was for many, many hundreds of years non-existent. See, God isn't interested in religion if there isn't at the same time heart change. It's empty. And it won't save you. Well, that's the message of Jeremiah to people in his day. The question is, how does it apply nowadays uh, to us? Um, and uh, we have a great help here because Jesus actually quotes from this sermon of Jeremiah's in a remarkably similar context. I love that. When Jesus picks out a verse from the Old Testament, it's only, um, you have made it a den of robbers. One, two, three, just a few words he uses but he absolutely captures the message of Jeremiah and the context of the chapter. Here we are in Mark chapter 11. Jesus has come to Jerusalem. He's gone into the temple. There are people going on buying and selling at the same time as they despise God and they despise his Messiah. And Jesus is about to explain the parable of the tenants, that God has sent messengers and prophets and they've beaten them. We think of Jeremiah. That's the treatment he received. Finally, God sends his son to them. And they kill him. And at the same time, they carry on the business in the temple. Just as if everything was normal. And I guess they did it, didn't they, on that first Easter Saturday. Kill Jesus on Friday. Go to church on Saturday. I, I bet they did. I remember um, a preacher when I was at university saying, what do you think the high priest did when the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom? Answer, they got out the sewing machine as quickly as they could in time for normal services the next day. A remarkably similar context. They're going about their religion, but they don't care about God and they don't care about his king. And Jesus says, isn't it written, my house should be a, a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. So what do they do? They hear this sermon. Do they think, oh, good, goodness, Jesus. Yes, you're right. We need to amend our ways. We're really sorry. We repent. Please forgive us. No. Uh, instead, verse 18 of Mark 11, the chief priests and the scribes heard it. They were seeking a way to destroy him. It's remarkably similar, isn't it? That's exactly how they responded to Jeremiah's words. Let's kill him. He deserved to die for saying this about the temple. They don't even spot the irony, even though they, they ought to know the words of Jeremiah, being uh, scholars of their own scriptures. They don't even spot the irony as they do the same. I think the message nowadays is the same message 
to those who trust in religion when there is no repentance. Jesus warned against it repeatedly, the emptiness of religion. Now, we might add to that this superstition because people go to St. Paul's Cathedral and they put a sign on the outside saying, this is the house of God, and it's not. It's a beautiful building designed by Christopher Wren quite well, and it looks beautiful, but it isn't the house of God. Um, The temple was the house of God, but actually, even if it were the house of God, it wouldn't do any good uh, without obedience to God's word. The, The message comes to us the same. But wonderfully, later in Jeremiah, we'll discover a great solution. And in some ways, the gloomy bits of Jeremiah for the first 29 or so chapters set out the problem so that we understand that the solution is exactly the right one. I don't want to steal the thunder of David Jackman, who um, I'm very sad to say gets the, the jewel in the crown. You know when you're dividing up a series to preaching, you always try and get the best bits for yourself. I did the Jeremiah series I was desperate to get chapter 31, but I'm afraid it, it didn't work out. Um, in the same way as when we were doing Revelation, I was desperate not to get Revelation chapter 20, which is the trickiest bit, and I got it. So, you know, the Lord has something to teach me. I don't want to steal the thunder. Well, actually, I do want to steal the thunder, but I'm going to try not to. But in Jeremiah 31, um, God is going to say there's a, a great new deal coming, a new covenant, a new way of relating to God that is going to involve heart change. Interestingly, the, the, the biggest difference between the old covenant and the new covenant in this respect is that there's a new temple. We've, we've talked about that already throughout our service. In the beginning, and back then, there was a, a building in Jerusalem, and now there is the Lord Jesus. But then there was a place you had to go to, now there is a person. And in Christ, we become temples of the Holy Spirit. God dwells amongst us as a people. It doesn't matter, actually, if we're not in a beautiful old building as we happen to be now. If we were were to meet in a school, uh, it would be the same. We would still be the temple of God, the people in whom God dwells. That's a massive change between the old covenant and the new covenant. But I think, as I just reflected on this sermon, I got the significance of that change slightly wrong. It used to be that they went to a building to meet God, and now God comes to our hearts. That's the change. I thought it was a change because the the temple wasn't very good. All the palaver of having to go to a building in Jerusalem, that's a bit rubbish. Much better now to have God dwelling in our hearts. Well, that's true. There are great advantages, aren't there, of being able to pray to God anywhere Um, any place, any time. But actually, in a sense, there wasn't anything wrong with the temple. It was a glorious thing. The biggest change is the unsuitability of our hearts to be a place that God could live in. And the fact that the new covenant makes that possible. The fact that God comes to live here isn't that the temple wasn't a fitting place for him before. It's that this wasn't a fitting place for him before. And through the Lord Jesus and his death and resurrection, through the work of the Holy Spirit to transform somebody who trusts him from the inside, well then God can come and live with us. And the change isn't just to our religion on Sundays, but to our hearts. No real Christian life without heart change. So if you, um, as I did for many years, go by the label Christian, and that means for you church on Sundays, but whatever you like the rest of the time, that's not a Christian. But if by the name Christian you mean an encounter with Jesus, so that he's changed me on the inside, so that now I love his ways and want to honour him, and I've become the place that he can dwell, well, then in a wonderful way, you could say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, because it, it really would be. This really would be it. Though, as, as, in as much as we're people who've trusted in Jesus and his Holy Spirit has transformed us, we are his temple, and we will be delivered. 
But religion without repentance won't save you. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the prophet Jeremiah, for his courage in being almost the lone voice against all the prophets and priests of his day. And as they said, religion was available um, on any terms. He demanded repentance and real transformation. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that the Lord Jesus picked up Jeremiah's words and showed us exactly what they mean. Uh, We pray, Lord, that we would not be those who trust in religion at the expense of loving you or caring about your words. We wouldn't be those for whom what ought to be your glorious worship has become a den of robbers. But we thank you, Father, that through the transforming death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we can be cleaned on the inside and that heart, our hearts can become a fit dwelling place for you by your Spirit. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.